And as the children are making their way outside, let's go ahead and raise up our Bibles or our tablet or whatever it is that you uh, love to study the Word on Sunday mornings with. Let's go ahead and raise them up high and make our weekly declaration together. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you are a guest with us this morning, we want to once again welcome you. We have been going through a study out of the book of Judges, which we've also entitled the book of Heroes. And uh, in review of chapter 9, where we were at last week uh, in the book of Judges, we've discovered that the nation of Israel in this chapter has gone through uh, a dark time under the leadership of a guy by the name of Abimelech who was self-seeking, self-promoting, and self-serving. However, his leadership is short-lived as he self-destructs and basically takes everyone else down with him in the process. But as we pick up this morning in chapter 10, once again, out of the ashes, God raises up a couple of men who become the next heroes and the next deliverers of the children of Israel, delivering them from <laughs> their destructive ways and patterns. And so with that, if you could turn with me <laughs> to Judges chapter 10. If you're not familiar with the Bible, Judges is in your Old Testament. It's after Joshua and before uh, Ruth. Judges chapter 10. And we'll start out by looking at the first five <laughs> verses together. It says, Now after Abimelech died, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, arose to save Israel, and he lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty-three years. Then he died and was buried in Shamir. And after him, Jair the Gileadite arose and judged Israel twenty-two years. And he had thirty sons who rode on thirty donkeys. And they had thirty cities in the land of Gilead that are called Havoth Jair to this day. And Jair died and was buried in Kaman. And so here in the first five verses we read that God, over a period of about 45 years, He raised up two men to serve as judges over the nation of Israel. The first is the guy by the name of Tola, and the second is a guy by the name of Jair. And so again, these two uh, become judges or deliverers or heroes that God raises up to deliver the nation of Israel from their self-destructive ways. And what is interesting, as you saw, is that not a lot is said about them. But I have two thoughts <laughs> in regard to this before we actually uh, begin to talk about these two leaders uh, in a moment. First, some people get more attention and more headlines than others. 
But that doesn't mean that they accomplish more than someone else. For some reason, God in his sovereignty chose not to elaborate much on Tola and Jair's lives. And you know, in the same way, you and I may serve God faithfully for decades, but never get the headlines or the attention that someone else does. And what should this teach us? It teaches us a very simple yet profound lesson that we must all learn throughout our lives, and it's this. The key is that we must live for an audience of one. Let me say that again. We must live for an audience of one. Our desire must be to please God, not impress man. I want to repeat that. Our goal must be to please God, not impress man. The psalmist wrote, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name be the glory. You see, the need for recognition destroyed Abimelech, and it has destroyed many people throughout history. And so may we never place our need for recognition above our need for revelation, meaning this, may we never settle for the recognition of man Man when we can receive a greater revelation of the glory of God. You see, that's what we should be living for. Not the recognition of man, but that we, as we walk with him and talk with him, that we would have a greater revelation of who he is and his glory in our lives. Now, second, this teaches us that we don't always need to know the whole story. It always amuses me when I come across people and they think that they're entitled to know everything. And if they don't know everything, somehow someone is trying to cover up something. But loved ones, here's the deal. Sometimes both God and man withhold information from us, just like in this story. There's not a lot we know about these guys. And he does it sometimes to protect us, whether we realize it or not. Sometimes God keeps us in, in the dark in regard to certain things because he wants to protect us. Second, sometimes it's to protect someone else. It has nothing to do with us, but it has everything to do with someone else. Third, and I know that we don't like this, but the third reason is sometimes it's because it's none of our business. <laughs> well, I'm making it my business. <laughs> oh, don't you love those words? Other times it's to keep a confidence. The Lord and, and man have many reasons. There's many things that as a parent you don't share with your children. It's to protect them. Maybe to protect others. Whatever it might be. Even scripture says we know in part and we prophesy in part. And so here's the deal. We should never ever feel like we are entitled to know everything. God tells us what we need to know, not what we want to know. And that will be the case throughout all of our lives. And so concerning Tola and Jair, there's more that we don't know than there is that we do know. But what we do know about these two guys is pretty cool. What we do know is this. We know that Tola was the grandson of a dodo. Now, I would have wanted that information withheld. <laughs> I don't know about you. 
But we read that he saved the nation of Israel and that he served as a judge or as a deliverer, a hero for 23 years. Now, it does not tell us how he saved, that is, how he defended, how he delivered the nation of Israel, like we see with Gideon. There's a lot we learn about how he did, and, and Deborah, and others that are mentioned as well. But somehow, some way, God used Tola to deliver his people. Now, one hint of how God might have used Tola was that we are told that he was a, a man of Issachar. And it's very interesting, this tribe of Issachar, because in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 32, it says this, listen. It says, of the sons of Issachar, men, here it is, who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. I like that. You see, Issachar was the ninth son of Jacob born to Leah. And perhaps Tola is cut from the same cloth. I have a sneaking suspicion that he was. He was a man of wisdom. He is someone who also carried great discernment. And therefore, he knew what needed to be done for Israel for, to, to rise from the ashes and once again walk in victory as a people. It's also interesting that the name Issachar, it literally means will bring a reward. <laughs> will bring a reward. And this is exactly what Tola <laughs> did. And isn't that how we should all want to live our lives? And that is, don't we desire to bring a blessing or a reward as we engage with others and minister to others? When God called Abraham, he told them this. He said, Abraham, I have blessed you so that you might be a blessing to others. And so... That's how we should see our lives, and that's how we should live our lives, that we will bring a great reward as we engage with and connect with and impact the lives of others. And so the sons of Issachar and Tola, they, they, they were people of wisdom and discernment. And in Ecclesiastes... <laughs> Chapter 7, verse 19, it says this. Would you read this out loud with me? Let's begin. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Ecclesiastes 9, 16, let's begin. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. Ecclesiastes 9, 18. Let's begin. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. And so here we sh uh, see that Scripture shines a light in regard to the place, the profound place that wisdom plays in the life of the believer, in the life of a leader, in the life of a church. Now an un another interesting tidbit is that Tola's name, it means scarlet or crimson. Crimson or scarlet. And we find his name, check this out. <laughs> we find his name being used in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where scripture states this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, literally in the Hebrew, tola, they will be white as wool. Isn't that cool? And so Tola in the Old Testament is a type of Jesus who delivered his people from their sins. Now, we also saw that Tola was followed by Jair. Jair was a Gileadite, and he too saved 
the nation of Israel, and he served as a judge for 22 years. He followed after Tola. And Gilead was a mountainous region just east of the Jordan River, and you may have heard about the balm of Gilead. And this refers to a specific healing substance that is produced by a plant, a specific plant that grows in Gilead. Now Gilead was also the homestead of the prophet Elijah. And we don't know a lot about Jair as well, but what we do know is that he had 30 sons who owned 30 donkeys that ruled over 30 cities. <laughs> now, granted, on surface level, this may not mean much to the casual reader until we remember that Jesus rode into a city, specifically the city of Jerusalem, on the back of a donkey, didn't he? And you see, this act of riding into some place on the back of a donkey, this act is a reflection of humility. It's also a picture of peace. You, you see, uh, when someone wants to uh, overtake a city, they come riding on a stallion. Or in a chariot with horses and stallions pulling it. That's what conquerors do. But those who have a servant's heart, you see, just like Jesus, they ride on the back of a donkey. And in this guise, we discover an important truth, and it's this. We discover that whenever we enter into a place, into a city, into a church, into a ministry, that we should do so in the spirit of humility. We should be messengers of peace, and we should carry with us the healing powers of the balm of Gilead. And whereas Tola led the nation of Israel through great uh, wisdom and discernment, Jair led the nation of Israel through humility and peace and healing. Not a lot that we know about them, but what we do know is pretty cool. And we discover here another <laughs> very vital and valuable lesson, and it's this. Please hear this. As different seasons come and go, sometimes God needs different leaders with different strengths and different gifts and different insight to lead his people to where he wants them to go. And so whatever it is that people need at the moment, God will raise up a leader to meet that need. And so if there's a need for great wisdom, God raises up a tola. If there is a need for peace and great humility, if healing needs to occur, God raises up a Jair. And so it goes. God has a leader for every season we go through. And wise is the person who recognizes it as such. Now, <laughs> we continue to read on in verse 6. And it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals and the Ashtoreth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. That's a lot of gods. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. And they afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year. For 18 years they afflicted all the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in Gilead in the land of the Amorites. And the sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. 
And then the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. And the Lord said to the sons of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians? the Amorites, the sons of Ammon, and the Philistines. I mean, haven't we already been there and done that, is what God's asking them. <laughs> also, when the Sidian, uh, Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you, you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hands. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods, therefore I will no longer deliver you. Go and cry out to the gods with which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. And the sons of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us this day. And so we read in this passage that Israel repeats its pattern of going three steps forward and then two steps backward. That, that is the story of the book of Judges. Three steps forward, two steps backward. And the nation of Israel reaps the consequences of their actions. And they did so for a period of 18 long years. For 18 years they worshipped false gods and embraced the idols of the world. And as a result of their destructive way of living, we're told that they came to a place where they were greatly distressed. I mean, these guys are under a lot of pressure, and, and, and they're distressed over the place that they have found themselves. And, and perhaps you, you've experienced this as well, that you've, there have been times in your life that you walked away from the Lord, that you forsook Him, and you chose your own way, and you began to uh, worship false gods, and, and, and embrace idols, and, and as time goes on and on and on, you find yourself hopeless, and helpless, and under great distress because of what you have done, and where you have found yourselves at. You see, the fruit of disobedience is distress. Let me say that again. The fruit of disobedience is distress. Someone once said this. Let's read this uh, out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And that is the case here in this book and throughout this time frame in the book of Judges. Guys, please hear this. Sometimes in His wisdom, God leaves us to our own devices. And notice how they wanted God to deliver them while still holding on to their various false gods. You're saying, we've sinned, delivered us. We've sinned, we've delivered us. They've confessed, but they haven't yet repented. Hmm. Sound familiar? And so they were confessing their sin, but they weren't repenting of it. They continued on, and, and they were continuing to worship all these false gods, gods like, like Baal, the god of intellect, and Ashtoreth, the god of sex, and Mammon, the god of money. Things haven't changed much over the years, have they? Now, <laughs> we read on in verse 16. And it tells us this. So they put away the foreign gods from among them. You, you see, they, they, they wanted God to deliver them, but still let them hold on to their false gods. But verse 16 is very important. 
So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. Loved ones, it's only when they finally got rid of their false gods and their idols that the true and living God responds to their cries. And we discover something very profound here, and it's this. Please hear this. We discover here that we can cry to God all we want, but if we continue to hold on to the very things that are destroying us, there is really nothing God can or will do for us. We really do need to let go and let God. We can't cry out to Him while still holding on to the things that are destroying our faith and our life and our walk. Now, <clears throat> verses 17 and 18 says, Then the sons of Ammon were summoned, and they camped in Gilead, and the sons of Israel gathered together and camped in Mizpah. And the people... The leaders of Gilead said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the sons of Ammon? He shall become head over all the inhabitants of Israel. Now, verse 18 is the springboard uh, in chapter 10 to us entering into chapter 11. And, and what we discover in this verse, verse 18, is also a very important spiritual principle, and it's this. Great leaders may not always have the right answers, but they have learned to ask the right question. Okay? Great leaders may not always have all the answers or the right answers, but they have learned to ask the right questions. And this is what the people are doing right here. They're asking the right question. Who is going to deliver us again? Who is going to lead us again? Who do we need in this new season who has the strengths and the gifts and whatever it is that we need to deliver us really from ourselves? And that brings us to chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, that is, Jephthah's brothers, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And so Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah, and they went out <coughs> with him. And so here, Jephthah is born, he grows up, and what, what we see here is, is notice that Jephthah's mother was a harlot. And so Jephthah uh, doesn't begin his interest, entrance into the world in a very good place. Jephthah was an illegitimate child. And Jephthah's fa uh, family, because of this, they reject him and they kick Jephthah out of their household and out of his inheritance. And in his estrangement from his family, Jephthah is surrounded with worthless people. And this was a very, very dark time in Jephthah's life. He is removed and he is rejected from his family. But praise God, listen, that's not the end of his story. And loved ones, if you find yourself in the same place, it's not the end of your story either. We discover here another vital life lesson, and it's this. Please hear me. Your past does not have to define or determine your future. I want to say that again. 
Your past does not have to define or determine your future. You see, our stories are still being written. And so don't let there in your story be a period in your life when there should only be a comma because the story's not yet through. And yet so often... We allow ourselves to be victims of our circumstances or our past mistakes. But the Apostle Paul, he puts it this way. He says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on to what lies ahead. Loved ones, never, ever, ever let your past define who you are. And never, ever let your past determine your future. And never, ever let your past limit you in pursuing God's will and God's best for your life. Because let me tell you, you're in some good company. Moses murdered someone, but God didn't give up on him. Job rebelled in a major way. He ran from God. God gave him a mission, an assignment, and he went in the opposite direction. But God did not give up on Job. David. Excuse me, Jonah. I got it. Jonah wasn't as old as I am. Matter of fact, I'm his older brother. Okay? And so, the same thing with David. David committed adultery. David also had somebody murdered. Peter denied knowing Jesus three different times, but Jesus did not give up on any of them. And so what he did do though is he forgave them and he gave each of them a future and a hope and he will do the same thing for us as well. Aren't you glad? You see, there's also something very important and strategic that we read also in these first three verses, and it's this. This is the key. Jephthah was a valiant warrior. You might want to underline that in your Bible. Put an asterisk. Circle it. Jephthah was a valiant warrior. And here's the deal. You have to be willing to fight against past failures and past disappointments in order to move forward in the things of God. We can't stay there. We can't live there. And we have to be able to move beyond man's rejection to find God's acceptance and God's solution. Now we read on. It says, it came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. And when the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, the one that they had removed and rejected, <laughs> come and be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. And then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not have me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? Good question. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, for this reason we have now returned to you that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And so Jephthah said to the elders against the sons of Ammon and the Lord... Uh, it, Excuse me. And so Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? 
In other words, are you just blowing smoke here? Or do you really mean what you mean? Am I going to be your chief? Am I going to be your head? Am I going to be your covering? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. And then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. And so they call upon this one that was removed and rejected, that was forgotten and forsaken. But you see, what we also discover is that Jesus himself was a man of sorrows, rejected and despised by men. You see, loved one, if someone is rejecting you right now, whether it be a friend or a co-worker or family, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He too was despised. He too was rejected. He knows exactly what you're experiencing and what you're going through. And he wants you to know this. And we discover yet another spiritual principle, and it's this. Sometimes God can use our dark past to serve his purposes. Jephthah is removed and rejected. He's forgotten and forsaken. He's surrounded by worthless fellows. But God hadn't forgotten him. God hadn't forsaken him. God didn't remove him or reject him. He was always in the plans and the purposes of God. No matter what man thought of him. And we can take courage and we can take heart in that truth. It's not man that determines our fate. It's God who brings us into our destiny, you see. And we see in the life of Jephthah something I love very much. We see here the story of redemption. And this is perhaps my favorite attribute of God, and that is God is a redeemer. Aren't you glad? As a matter of fact, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a story about redemption, and Jephthah is one of the greatest chapters in God's story of redeeming mankind. Now, we continue reading in verse 12, and we'll wrap things up in a bit. Of course, my definition of a bit and yours might be a bit different. But. <laughs> verse 12, Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, <laughs> What is between you and me that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the sons of Ammon said to the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up from Egypt, from the Ammon, Arnon, as far as Jabek and the Jordan, therefore return them peaceably now. But Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the sons of Ammon, and they said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the sons of Ammon. For when they came up from Egypt, and Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen, and they also sent the king of Moab, and he would not consent. And Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they went through the wilderness, and around the land of Edom, and the land of Moab, and came to the east side of the land of Moab, and they camped beyond the uh, Ammon, but they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Ammon was the border of Moab. 
in Israel sent messengers to Sidon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to them, Please let us pass through your land to our place. But Shion, or Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Shion gathered all his people and camped in Jabez and fought with Israel. And the Lord God of Israel gave Sihon and his, all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And so they possessed all the territory of the Amorites, from the Ammon as far as Jabak, and from the wilderness as far as the Jordan. Since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you then to possess it? Did you not possess what Chimon, your God, gives you to possess? So, whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we will possess it. Now, are you, now are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive with Israel, or did he ever fight against them? And while Israel lived in Heshbon, and its villages, and in Aor, and its villages, and all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, three hundred years, why did you not recover them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge, judge today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. Now, notice in this passage of Scripture, I read it to give us some context here. Notice that Jephthah makes reference to my land. And also the king of, of Ammon says, because Israel took away my land. And guys, this has been a bone of contention for centuries regarding who has the rights to the land of Israel. And we see here that Israel's enemies possess part of Israel's inheritance for 300 years. And there's always been, if you know history, if you know the Bible, there has always been anti-Semitism in the world. There has always been hatred towards the nation of Israel, and there has always been battles over the land that God gave and promised to the nation of Israel, even in recent history. 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, Israel has been attacked over their land and over their right as a sovereign nation. And they have been outnumbered, they have been outgunned astronomically at times. But each time God miraculously delivered them from their enemies and this is a historic fact that cannot be denied. And so Jephthah, he, he gives the king of Ammon, he gives him a history lesson that we would all do well to remember because it amazes me really how much anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment that I hear coming out of the Christian church today. It, it baffles me. And I say that, hear this, I say that not for the sake of politics. I could care less about politics. You know I don't teach about politics. I say it for the sake of God's promises to His people. And so, you see, for the sake of God's promises to His people, for me and my house, we will stand with the nation of Israel as God rains down His grace upon us. Now, one last passage, and we'll 
finish with this. Verse 29. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And so God's Spirit comes upon him after he makes this de declaration in regard to the land of Israel. That's a very important thing. The Spirit of the Lord is the affirmation and the anointing of the Lord. So that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give me the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whoever comes out the doors of my house to meet me when I return... Uh, in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And so Jephthah crossed over the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He struck them with a very great slaughter from Aor to the entrance of Mineth, twenty cities, and as far as Abel Karaman. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. And when Jephthah came into his house at Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word word to the Lord and I cannot take it back. And so if you read on in the rest of the story, he ends up sacrificing his one and his only child to the Lord. She's slaughtered and what we see here is Jephthah's flippant and unfortunate vow. It's also an unnecessary vow. And guys, sometimes this is what happens when we try to negotiate with God. Don't negotiate with God. And don't presume upon God. Don't make flippant vows to God. And yet, oh, how often we do that very thing. God, if you do this, I promise to do that. Right? We've all been there. We've all done it. And we make these flippant vows to the Lord that we end up never keeping. Well, Jephthah presumed upon God. And this is one of the more concerning and confusing passages of Scripture. But it's important to note, loved ones, this. God never told Jephthah to do this. Never. This was not God's command, nor was it God's guidance. Jephthah didn't even seek the counsel of man over this. It was such a flippant vow. vow. He expected that maybe one of his servants would run out to, to greet him. It was a wrong presumption on his part. Jephthah, he made a unilateral move without consulting God. And there's an interesting passage in Scripture that shines light on this. It's Psalm 15, verse 1. It says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill? It goes on to say, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness, who speaks truth in his heart. And then you skip down to verse 4, and it says, In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, he swears or he makes a vow to his own hurt and does not change it. You see, oh, how this vow hurt Jephthah. But even despite his tremendous agony and pain and hurt over what he had done, he carried out the vow nonetheless. Because you see, 
He made it. It was stupid. It was unneeded. Yet, he kept his vow despite the fact that it hurt him so deeply. And guys, here's what I want us to close with. It's this. Despite his grave mistake, his grave error, his lack of judgment, his stupidity in this situation, Jephthah nonetheless ends up in Hebrews chapter 11 as a hero of the faith. He ends up in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, which once again tells us that God chooses to see us at our best and not at our worst. Would you guys stand with me and let's close in a, a prayer together. Let's pray this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Father God, help us to live for an audience of one. And may we seek revelation more than we seek after recognition. Teach us to be good leaders in our homes, our church, in our community. Also help us understand that our past does not have to define or determine our future. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the elders and the prayer team to come forward. We're going to close in a song of worship. And if you have need of prayer for anything, I want to encourage you to come and to be prayed for. As we like to say, there's nothing too big and there's nothing too small. God cares about it all. And perhaps something uh, about today's message struck a chord in your heart. And you want to come and you want to bring that uh, before the Father. I want to encourage you, don't hold on, let go. Maybe something in regard to your past that uh, you feel has disqualified you somehow or some way. Would you come and would you get God's perspective on it? Because He sees you much different than you see yourself. And so uh, we want to encourage you, whatever your need is. And if you should be here and you don't know Jesus... You don't know this great God and Savior. He's our deliverer. He's our superhero. He came from heaven to earth and uh, lived a perfect life. He became a perfect sacrifice, dying on the cross for my sins and for yours. That whosoever should believe in Him and accept His gift should not perish but have everlasting life. If you've never made that commitment, I want to encourage you to come and do so. And we'd love to pray with you and help you in your new journey. God bless you guys.
thank you for the love that you've shown us, God. Yeah, we just thank you for how much you love us, God, even though we comprehend so little of it, God. But we choose to praise you today, God. be the posture of our lives, God. I think you'd help us, remind us to be thankful, Jesus. And you just fill us with the joy of our salvation, God. As this week is the week of joy in this Advent season, Lord. So I pray that you'd remind us of all that you've done, Lord. Fill us with your joy, Lord Jesus. that you would just have our focus this week, God, that you'd have our, our praise and our worship throughout the week. Just reveal yourself to us, Jesus. We want to know you, Lord. We just thank you. We praise you this morning, God. We say all this in Jesus' name and say amen. Amen. amen.